Explain to us what this budget is going to lay out. It is, it's our understanding that the administration would like to spend more on defense. The Congress would probably like to spend more on uh, discretionary spending here in the United States. Is that about a fair statement of what you expect to have play out? It's a fair statement. Look, we're $22 trillion in debt. We have trillion dollar deficits as far as the eye can see, and we need to do something about it. This budget puts for $2.7 trillion in spending reductions over the next 10 years and balances within 15 years. We think that's an important debate to have. Congress may resist it, but we also think that they uh, have an interest and in, we hope they have an interest in, in uh, maintaining, in, in getting rid of the deficit, and that's the conversation we want to have with them going forward. Where are the spending cuts in your budget? The spending cuts over the in the budget are at the discretionary spending levels. All the agencies that you see around Washington, D.C., they're in foreign aid, they're in uh, welfare reform. Uh, we are making reforms to, to student loans and federal retirement programs. Many of the reforms that we have are not what we would call a cut. M many of them are savings and reforms to make programs work better, make, make them more accountable, less wasteful, and we think that uh, there's going to be receptivity to those. A big item, though, is going to be defense spending, uh, overseas contingency operations. Can you explain that to us in the budget? Because according to the 2011 law, we would see defense and discretionary spending at home both capped at, at levels, uh, I, I think it's $576 billion for defense, $542 billion for domestic programs. Sure. The president, though, would like to see a lot more spent on defense. So how, how does this come into play? Sure. The budget proposes a 5% increase in defense up to $750 billion. Previously this year, it would be $716 billion. Uh, we think it's important to continue to uh, uh, rebuild the military from the years of the uh, Obama administration. Uh, we propose to do that both within the current law caps that exist and, as you mentioned, which are coming down. And we think we can put forward all of the additional money that is necessary in what is called the Overseas Contingency Operations Account. Uh, this is something in which we'll be very transparent about, uh, but it has, it has no cap to it. And it allows us to be able to uh, ask Congress to fund our priorities and consider the President's 5 percent cut to non-defense discretionary without a $300 billion cap deal to increase the, the caps that are in law that Congress often doesn't pay for and are, is, has really contributed to the, the large deficits that we're seeing in the next 10 years. But Russ, you realize that budget watchdogs say that this is really just a backdoor way uh, of in increasing that spending without really tackling any of the problems. Understand the concerns that, that some have raised, but we view this as an opportunity. Uh, the caps are coming down. We want to stick to those caps. The overseas contingency account is something that is uncapped. It allows us to transparently move forward and rebuild the military and avoid a $350 billion cap deal that we cannot so afford you, as a you country. Don't, you don't want to stick to the caps when it comes to defense, just when it comes to domestic spending? We want to stick to the caps and we want to continue the rebuild by putting it in the overseas counter uh, in, uh, fund. You know, I, I know that uh, you started out talking about this and you did have an op-ed that was out talking a little bit about how you think that Congress really has to come in and cut spending and join in doing that with the president. Um, last week when I started looking at some of the numbers, just what's been coming into the Treasury, it's not the amount of money the Treasury is raising that's really the problem. It is spending. But when you look into, dig into the lines on what's causing that increase in spending, it gets down to some basic issues. It's Social Security, it's Medicare and Medicaid, it's defense spending, and then it's increased spending for um, interest payments on, on our debt. So uh, the budget is not necessarily going to be able to tackle any of that. How do you get at those bigger issues? The interest spending that we're currently doing is a major problem. Within five years, we're going to be spending more on interest payments than we are in national defense. Uh, I think you're getting at the, the structural issues that we have with regard to mandatory spending. This budget has more mandatory savings than any president's budget in history, and we continue to keep the president's commitments to seniors uh, who benefit from Medicare and Social Security. We can reform mandatory savings. We propose to do that in this budget, and the president has done that in the last two budgets that he has sent to Congress. We also need to get, look, take a look at discretionary spending. Too often, mandatory spending reforms has been used as an excuse to do the hard work of getting rid of reducing wasteful programs and discretionary spending, which is what Congress can control every single year with their votes, as opposed to it being on autopilot. But what, what's the long-term plan in terms of looking at things like Social Security and, and Medicare and Medicaid? Again, this president has made commitments to the American people. We, in this budget, continue to put forth mandatory reforms that lower the costs in these programs by mm -hmm. having 
uh, reforms and uh, common sense proposals to make the programs work better at the same time as maintaining the president's commitment to those important programs. Uh, the early news reports have been that this budget today will ask for $8.6 billion in funding for the wall uh, with Mexico. Is that correct? Uh, we do have an $8.6 billion request to Congress to, to complete the wall. This is in addition to the uh, billions of dollars that uh, we are securing through the president's declaration of a national emergency. As you know, this is an area where we're getting tired of being right. The border situation is, de is deteriorating by the day. When we started the conversation uh, throughout last year, uh, Democrats were saying that there was no national emergency. They're still saying that. But I don't know how you can continue to make that assertion when the Department of Homeland Security Secretary and the Commissioner of the Customs and Border Patrol continue to go to the Hill and say that we are having record numbers of apprehensions and we will be having more apprehensions in the first six months than we did in the entirety of last year. It sounds like there are a lot of differences between the administration's perspective and uh, at least the House perspective on how this spending should be taking place. Where, where, where if any, are there any uh, areas that the two kind of see eye to eye? Uh, we'll see in the coming days. I'll be up on the Hill testifying in the next two days about where we can find common ground. That's an important conversation that we'll have over the next several months. Uh, hopefully we can look at wor workforce development and child care and look forward to those opportunities. Infrastructure is something where we feel like we can have common ground. Hopefully we can find common ground in lowering drug pricing and some of the reforms that we've put forward. Uh, but that's an important conversation that we're going to have.